The world is staring down the barrel of climate change. In 2015, we committed to a global agreement to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions so we could keep climate change to only one and a half degrees. Air transport is a special scrutiny. It's currently, its emissions have grown by 75% since 1990. That's double the rest of the economy. Despite oil crisis, wars and global recession, the demand for air transport keeps growing and it grows inexorably on an exponential rate. In fact, the world economy, and in particular the New Zealand economy, relies on this growth. In New Zealand, we have $12 billion of international tourism, 99% of which comes in by air. We have $20 billion of our high-value exports travel by air. So even though we are expecting and planning for the air travel to continue its growth, and it's going to double by 2050, we have signed up to keep in total aviation emissions at the current levels. So to deliver that climate agreement that we've made, while still maintaining that growth and maintaining the economy, we must achieve a 30% improvement in, in the fuel efficiency of our aircraft. Business as usual is not an option. How can this efficiency be achieved? At the Robinson Institute, Research Institute, my team and I are carrying out development that will drastically reduce emissions from commercial aviation whilst catering to that growing demand for passenger air miles. So, but first, let's talk about the current aviation technology. A Rolls-Royce Trent 700 engine is incredibly reliable. They fail in service for less than one event in a million hours of flight. Put that into context, that's one event in a hundred years of running. I think very few of you have got a car engine that would do that. <laughs> Jet engines are super efficient. They have been developed very, for a very long time to very high efficiency. But they're super efficient at full speed. The problem is throttling up, throttling down and idling. Because we do a lot of throttling up, throttling down and idling in a commercial flight, we're unlikely to gain that fuel efficiency from a jet engine. We need a new technology. Electrification of transport is a global trend. It's driven not just by climate emissions, it's also driven by a requirement to drive down the use of fuel. It's costly. Airlines, manufacturers, government bodies are all focused on electrification of air transport. But there are significant challenges. Those challenges are twofold. One, battery technology needs to be, become super powerful. We need to have much greater storage capacity. And at the same time, they must become much, much lighter. And secondly, we need electric engines that are both super efficient and super light to enable that flight. So let's talk about the first challenge. Battery technology is developing. At the current rates of technology development, we will have batteries that are capable of flying an electric 737 by 2050. But we need a solution by 2035. And the number one interim solution is for powering the motors by a turboelectric system. You can look at this as you take the front end of a jet engine. Remember, a jet engine is super efficient at full speed. We take that jet engine and we run it at full speed. And we use it to power a generator. 
we run that turbine at a fixed speed, driving the generator at its highest efficiency point. Because the electric motor is efficient over a wide throttle range. The concept is not new. It's in use worldwide in shipping. It's used in um, train systems. And so it's completely viable for aviation. So let's talk about that second challenge to make that turboelectric work. Electric engines that are both super light and super powerful. Right now, the best motors that have been developed and are looking to be developed can deliver 16 kilowatts a kilo. If we want to fly an electric 737, we need to be at 26 kilowatts per kilo. To get that kind of massive increase in power to weight ratio, we need a new technology. The solution is superconducting electric motors. So what's a superconductor? Well, it's an unusual class of materials that have a unique property. They pass massive amounts of current with no resistance. This allows vast magnetic fields to be created. It enables high currents to flow in windings without them getting warm, without dissipating power. And together, that enables smaller motors. The image behind us is a comparison of a ship motor of the same capacity. So what you can do with superconductors, you can make motors that are a third of the volume and a third of the mass when you compare that to a conventional motor system. But this technology was only discovered in 1987. But since that discovery of that class of material, it's now in routine commercial mass manufacture. So my team at the Robinson Research Institute have been working on applications of superconductivity since 1987, right at the discovery. Me, I've been working on the application to machines for the last 11 years. Our team at the Robinson Research Institute have supplied commercial solutions to many clients internationally, including Siemens, including the US Air Force, including CERN, and many others. And these include motor coils, rotors for motors, winding cables. So I think actually we know a little bit about this. My team and I are designing a novel motor with technology ready components ready to be applied that is aimed at exactly that electric 737 aircraft. It incorporates highly reliable DC superconducting magnets based on that same coded conductor new technology. And it has a simple mechanical construction. We've just been granted six and a half million to actually demonstrate that motor, take it to the demonstration stage and accelerate the development of turboelectric aircraft as part of an international effort. So the global aerospace industry know that there is only one solution to meet our requirement, and that is to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions through hybrid electric aircraft. They are the only viable solution. They will use aerodynamically optimised electric motors combined with turbofans and those superconducting motors. An electric drivetrain provides the very high efficiency air in output, and in this way, fuel efficiency gains of up to 33% can be achieved over the existing combustion jet technology. That gives us breathing space until battery technology is achieved, and we can get fuel efficiency gains of more than 70% once the batteries are there to combine with it. The concept design that's shown behind me is one from NASA. 
That design would not work without the power to weight ratio of a superconducting motor. It would not work without one. Introduction of new technology into aviation takes time and lots of certification. I'm fairly sure that you don't want to be falling out of the sky when the engine stops. <laughs> so introduction of technology happens through scaling. So we start with a small scale, say a regional aircraft, and it develops through and it's integrated and certified and it scales up until we reach an electric 737. It took 25 years to take composite technology that was used in the military into commercial aviation, which you think nothing of now in a 787. But all international efforts, and I believe all countries are involved in this, are working on a time frame for the superconducting technology to be integrated within a 20 to 25 year time frame. They will be flying. So what does the future hold? The future looks quite cool. <laughs> As aerodynamic integration of the motors and the, and, the, and the thrust system within the wings. It has a fully electric propulsion system. Superconductivity has been identified as the only way, and being critical to the development of that electric aircraft, that can deliver low emission and enable us to meet our commitments. And when the battery technology does get good enough, aircraft like these will deliver greater than 70% efficiency in fuel for those flights. Turboelectric superconducting aircraft will change the world. Thank you.